no, it was really odd to be in worship, and the bass wasn't so loud that my clothes vibrated. It's, it, that was, it's unique this morning. I'm like, uh, who was it? Was it Bella? I forget, Bella. Bella kept calling worship in the evening. She kept calling it loud church. I like that. It was neat. We're going to loud church. I'm like, I'm so stealing that. Um, because it was great. Uh, one of the best things that, uh, for me personally, and again, everybody, everybody worships different. I understand that. Everybody, you know, may not be your, your cup of tea. I get it. Um, but it was really neat for me to, to be there. And the music being so loud, but then to hear all the voices of all these teenagers rising above the sound and to sing praises to God. And I mean, it was just, oh, like, those are those moments where you, like, there was times where I just had to stop singing and just listen because it was that powerful. Uh, but we'll share that next. We'll, that, that's a, like your teaser for two weeks from now. Um, I know we have a, quite a few people still out because of power outages and things like that. Please be in prayer for them. Uh, please be in prayer that uh, power does come back on soon. And uh, be in prayer for those that are out working in this. I mean, it's it's one of those things, not just those who are out without power, but, you know, those who've probably been working way longer of hours, please be in prayer for them as well. This morning, we're starting off, we're still in our statement of faith, and uh, pointing these back out to you again. Today is one of those opportunities, because we're going to be talking specifically about uh, the, the person, the being of Satan, and we're going to talk about hell and those types of things, and so this is an opportunity for many of you to take an opportunity to look at something that you really do believe. We're going to take it out, and we're going to examine it. And I want to do this very openly and very honestly because I want you to know what many of you believe specifically about hell has nothing to do with the Bible but, but by another man. We're going to talk about him in a moment. Okay? So today when we're talking about our statement of faith, we're going to talk about what is, who is Satan, where is hell, those types of things. So we're going to take them out and we're going to look at them. For most of you, 95% of you, I promise you, you're probably going to put it right back in the same spot that you pulled it out of. For others, you might be going, hey, you know what? You're right, Pastor Mark. I've been thinking, you know, a lot, everything I understand right now is usually based off of somebody else. It might be time for me to go and study it for myself. I, I hope and want to encourage you that way. And for you, it might just move over just a little bit. That's okay. All right? The two things that we don't want, want to make sure that we, ignore, we, we avoid is, you know what? If it can move, I don't want any of it. Because there's, there's people in our world today, hey, look, you know, that's what Grandpa believed, and if, if Grandpa's wrong, I just don't know if I can stand to be wrong. God didn't save you through Grandpa. God saved you. He wants you to understand what you believe about the Bible. Others will just go, you know what, if it can move, I don't want anything to do with it, so I just don't want any of it to move. I don't even want to have the conversation. Right? That's also wrong. So today, this is my, four, this is my uh, warning of you. That we're, we're going to talk about some things that you may, might be upset about, and that's okay. So, let's, let's do a little bit of review. We've been talking about how a statement of faith is something for us to stand on. This is an opportunity for you to understand what we believe, and it helps you sort of articulate it in such a way that you can, you can not only stand on it, but then you can do something about it. You can study deeper, okay? We've also stated that because... Uh, everything that we do believe is based off of the Bible. Every, all, all of our other statements are based off of that, are built upon that. Okay, um, And that's the reason why you have the little grid over there that's over the top of the Bible. All the other statements, 2 through 13, are all based off the Scripture. Now, uh, we're going to be reading those Scriptures today and be talking about them some too. But I want you to understand that everything that we study and we believe is out of the Bible. If you, you want to disagree with me, absolutely. 100% welcome that, but if you want to disagree with the Bible, then we've got problems, okay? And that's just, we're very Baptist, and we're very, we're very biblical in that, st that standpoint. The other one that I do have up here is uh, from the last time we were together. Uh, we talked a little bit about a uh, person, whenever someone confesses Jesus Christ as Savior, that whole point of salvation and sort of what, what sort of happens in that. Uh, I actually got a message from a couple of you that said, hey, look, Pastor Mark, I've never even thought about that. All, all I've ever been taught is, hey, look, I confess Christ as Savior, I'm saved, and that's all I knew. Great. I'm hoping that that helps you sort of springboard you into studying God's Word a little bit more. Today is sort of the same way. Now, let's start off with probably the most, one of the most important statements we have, and it's number seven. So if you have your list, uh, you go ahead and 
pull it out. If you have your Bible, uh, we're going to be going a little, couple of different places. We're going to be going to Job and Matthew and Book of Revelation. So if you can't flip to all of them, understand that they're all there. But number, uh, statement number seven says this. We believe that Satan is a created being. Okay? Uh, in the parentheses there, we put fallen angel. Understand that fallen angel is not a term that you'll find in the Bible. It's a term that we have used to describe those who were once angels and uh, after, after Satan had, uh, had his in- insurrection were cast out of heaven. They, uh, they were cast upon the earth. Um, so instead of saying cast out, cast it out, how do you say that? Past tense of cast. Uh, maybe cast is just past tense. Um, cast out angels. It would be, uh, we call them fallen angels. And that hell is a place of eternal consequence, punished of all unsaved. Now, we give you a couple of verses here. Here's, here's what I want to let you know. Most of you have a view of Satan. If I was to say, hey, what does the devil look like? I can promise that some of you would start drawing because, look, most of my sports teams that I pull for are devils. It's just the way it works. I don't know why. There's an irony in there somewhere. But they're all, they all sort of have the same idea, right? They all have the pointy goatee. They usually have horns at some point in time. Uh, if they have wings, and some of them do and some of them don't, they somehow look like a bat, which we still can't figure out where they got that from. Um, but there's this whole sinister-looking idea of them. If I was to ask you to draw Satan, this is what you would come up with, wouldn't it? However, in God's Word, it doesn't say anything like that. And can I tell you why? I want you to know. Most of you as Christians have, a th- have an idea of Satan and hell, and it's all based off, not off of this, which is your Bible. It's actually based off of this. You know, know what this book is called? Dante's Inferno. Most of you have a view of Satan and a view of hell, and it's all because of one guy whose name is Dante. I read this. I love. It. I love. I actually love reading. I have, this is the, actually the whole the whole comedy. Um, and this, what's sort of funny is that it's actually called the Divine Comedy. Anyway, um, but most of you have this view of Dante's Dante's Inferno, and that is your view of hell. Why is that? Well, because that one's easier to understand than you going and reading the Bible for yourself. I, that hurts, but it's true. So. What, does, what, do we, what should we think about Satan? What should we think about hell? Let's look at a couple of the verses. Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. It says, Now there, were, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan along, came along with them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? And Satan answered to the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. What's really interesting about this is that Satan still has access to heaven. Did you know that? Satan still has access, still has the opportunity to talk to God. I love, I love the book of Job because if you really want an understanding of who Satan is, go study the book of Job. I love it. You want to know why? God's the one who actually asked Satan, Hey, have you considered my servant Job? For there's none like him on the earth. That's God speaking. That's not Satan. Ooh, that, makes, that gives you a whole different view of that scripture, doesn't it? Well, well, it didn't, he, has to, you know, he has to look evil. No, no, no. He looked like all the other angels. Well, I like angels to be pretty and small and little babies with diapers and angel, with these little feathery wings. Okay. It's wrong, but okay. But if you do that for one angel, guess what you got to do for Satan too? Oh, I don't like that. I like for Satan to be ugly and menacing and... It's not what God's word says. Well, what about what about this place called hell? Well, let's look at Matthew 25, 46. And it says, And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Well, that tells us a couple of things. Number one, it tells us there's always an eternity. And there are two locations. Real locations. I want you to know there's a group of people out in the world. And they will just say that hell is just, it's a separation from God. And I want you to know there is no separation from God. Ever. And all those things that you studied about God, God being all-present, all-powerful, all places at all times, even in hell, you cannot be separated from God. Now, you can be separated from the blessings of God, 
You can be set, you can be experiencing the punishment of God, and we'll talk about that. There's no separation. Well, what about Revelation? Well, look at this. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown. Now look at that. He was thrown into the lake of fire. So let's take some of the things that we understand. Now, I want you to know, um, this is actually a, an image that was drawn. And I want you to know the angel that you see there on top with the victory, and the, the, the that's Michael. Satan is actually on the bottom. Why is that? Well, your Bible, if you go and read your Bible and study your Bible, Michael whips Satan three times. Did you know that? You'll, every, so, every so often you'll see it, and it goes around social media, where it looks like there's a picture of like God and there's a picture of Satan and they're arm wrestling. If you or someone you know suffers from bad theology like that, please let me know. Because I'll be, I'll be very quickly to correct them. That's bad theology. Why? It's not a fight between God and Satan. That's not a fight. That's, that's not a fight. God could speak and Satan stop existing. Okay? That's not a fight. Michael, his equal, fights him. Michael wins. Well, but let's talk about this a couple things. So what, do, what should we believe about Satan? He is a created being. He is, not, he is not a God. Because he is not a God, he is then not equal to God. Quit trying to make him equal to God. Well, Pastor Mark, he, uh, I struggle a lot. Okay, great. Struggle. I feel like Satan's after me. I will tell you very quickly that you're not that important. Why? Satan is not a God. Then what? He can only be in one place at one time. He cannot be after you and after five other people. Now, he has demons. But can I tell you what most of our problem is? Go look in the mirror. Why do I want to blame a, blame a, a demon whenever I can do bad all by myself? I don't, need, I don't need influence. Psh, leave me alone just to myself. Well, I, will find, I will find sin all by myself. Okay? Now, this does, not, this does not negate the fact that there is times whenever you do have special pressures upon you, and I get that. But quit trying to blame everything on Satan. Look, own half. You need to own like 97% of it. And if he's not God, he's not equal to God. There is one thing that he does know. He does know his eternity. Go back and read. Whenever, whenever Jesus was casting out the demons, what did they say to him? Go back and read it. It is not yet our time. You cannot, you cannot throw us into the punishment yet because we know when our punishment's coming. He knows where, where, his, where he's going to be spending eternity future. Because of that, he is, in a, he is in a fight and in a race to bring as many people along as he can. And I want you to know, half of the world, the way the world's set up, eh, let someone else worry about it. I'll make that decision later. All lies that we continually tell ourselves from the father of lies. Go back and read. Go back and read Genesis. I love it. I love, I love the, the, inter, the interaction between Satan and, and Eve, specifically. He never, he never tempted her. What did he do? He opened up the question. What did she do? She filled in all the other spots. All by herself. And then, before you blame Eve too much, Adam was probably standing there, duh, Oh, I should eat this? Okay, whatever. So, Satan, a person, one place, one time. You've got to get that correct. The other one, this in this, hell, lake of fire. Some of you call it many different things. I want you to know the scripture actually talks about it in a couple of different ways. 
when we read the verse in, in, in Revelation, there actually is the eternal lake of fire, which means that there's a temporary lake of fire, which makes it kind of really interesting for us to think about that too. I mean, there's a, there's a temporary separation? Yeah, there's a temporary, pla- there's a temporary place too. And it says they're going to get cast, that, that's going to get picked up and going to get cast into it. What the beauty of this, if you go and you read and study a little bit more, what God is saying here is this, this, little, this little short death is going to get swallowed up in an eternal death. Is actually the words that he's using there. And I love that. Why? Because hell is a real eternal place. Whenever you die, and you do not, there's some people who believe in annihilation. Okay, annihilation means they, and it's in the side of Christianity. Okay, hey, Jesus is going to take all those who believe. Those who do not believe will just go into annihilation, which means they will just cease to exist. That's that's the side of Christianity. Okay, it's also wrong. Why? Book of Revelation. Look at this. I'll go back and read real quick. Matthew 25, 46, and they will go away into eternal punishment. Now, what does the word eternal mean? Forever. Thank you. If somebody's waiting for someone just to go, eternal. It's right. Eternal means eternal. It means forever. As far forward as you can ever think. And then keep going. That's eternal. And there's going to be people who are going to be in hell, in the lake of fire, for eternity this is the judgment of God not separation from him I think the saddest thing that my theology ever taught me out of the Bible was that God would never forget them to think about him saying to people depart from me for I never I never knew you and them being thrown into the lake of fire and in the thought of God, God has always known them. And for the rest of eternity, he will know exactly where they are. They will never cease to exist. That's a sad thought. But can I tell you what's even sadder? It's for you and me. If we're Christians and we did not evangelize to that person that was walking, how much, how much crying will we do whenever we see people that we know and people that we love and people that we've walked across the street with? And we're standing there and watching them walk over there. How many, how many, how many of you and I will be standing there? Because I want you to know, if you go and you read, he'll dry every tear. And, and Remember, he doesn't say he'll ever erase your memory. Watch him walk. Because we know that this is eternal. If this really is your statement of faith, I want you to know it will change the way that you evangelize. Because hell is eternal. Well, Pastor Mark, well, well, then what should we do? Well, let's go back up to statement number five. Statement number five says this. He says, we believe that all men are sinful by nature and as such are enmity. A good word there. We're going to talk about that in just a second. With God. Therefore, regeneration by the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential to salvation. Romans 3.19. Well, Romans 3.19 says this. Now we know that whatever law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to who? To God. Oh. Everyone's held accountable to God. What about, the, what about the, in the, the people who did not know who God was? They're still held accountable to God. You and I, you want, you're talking about being scared. You and I are, being, are held accountable to God. What are you going to do with it? Oh, Pastor Mark, I don't want to think about that. Well, we are. We're held accountable to God. What I love about this, though, is I want to give you the idea of how separated we are of man. Now, you, I want you to know. You'll have other groups, and they'll use really, really sophisticated words like the, the, pra- the depravity of man, which is really a really great definition of it. But I actually like taking it just a step further. And I like using this word, um, uh, in- enmity, E-N-M-I-T-Y. Can I tell you why? It really is the state or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. I like that. 
You want to know why? If you find someone who is not saved, they are not just sinning, they are hostile to a holy God. That's the reason why I love, I love babies. There's a little baby here with us today. Okay, Love babies. I love holding babies. You want to know, you know what? Because I've, I've said this to you before. I love looking at them and going, this is the most pretty heathen I have ever seen in my entire life. And I'm right. Why? At that stage, do they know God? No. And then we act, we act all up in arms whenever we have a lost and dying world that's actively against God. And we're like, oh, I can't believe you did that. I'm going, Psh. they're at war with God. Do you want to know why most of us struggle so for so long? Because we spent most of our life being what? At war with God. We're not used to being on his team yet. You're on his team, Okay. Now what do we do? I'm not fighting against him anymore. I don't know. If it is, uh, th- you start thinking about this logically. You go, oh, that, that does sound right. Yeah. Why? It's because of sin. We are not just separated from God, but we are at war. We are hostile with him until salvation. And it, salvation's a big deal. And we just keep going, oh, you know, we just keep going, oh, don't worry. It's just this little, this little decision. If you just make this little decision, it'll change your life forever. No, 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 no. It's a giant decision. It's a phenomenal decision. I'm so excited if, you'll, if you do accept. I'm so excited. We had, I want you to know, uh, the very person that they, they offered a, a, the plan of salvation, a lot of kids stood up, and, and everybody clapped. And it was great. Why? Because they went from being against God to being with God, and if Romans, Romans 8, and one of my favorite verses, and if God is for you, who can be against you? They're, they're on a new team now. They don't even know how to play the game yet. So what do we have to do with the new Christians? Also, all Christians have to do what? You need to start teaching them. And if you, I want you to know, and I've encountered this more and more each, each, each week that goes by. Every time I say that, hey, you know, having an older Christian, investing in a younger Christian, I cannot tell you the number of people in my life that continually call up to me and you go, Pastor Mark, you know what? I never had an older Christian ever invest in me. Oh, that just hurts. Why? And it has nothing to do with age. You're talking about truly just the maturity of, of Christianity. It means that they had to learn all the hard way. Whenever God called us to be a church and God called us to be loving one another and be in unity. And so what do we do? Well, this, what the statement is really telling us is that it's a really big decision. And if you stand with God and that divide, it's not, it's not narrow and it's not, that divide is not minor. That divide is massive. And if I hold on to that, then it's, well, oh, then if I hear someone being saved, then, then, it's what, then it's what? I should rejoice because I understand that the, the trials they had to go through. I understand the journey they had to go on. I, ha- I understand what it was like to once be against God and seeing God over there and me over here. And even though I may not have understood all of it, I understood that I had sin in my life and, and that sin was going to take me one place and that was hell. But now I've accepted Christ as Savior. Now I'm on this side of it and I'm going, this is awesome. I want to tell everybody. Like, you ever realize, you remember that first time when you got saved? You would have taken on hell with a water pistol by yourself. And then what? Life happens. Someone else will tell them. Someone else will make it. Someone, someone, don't, you, you, don't, you don't worry about evangelizing. Someone else will do that. Hey, don't worry about investing in them. Someone else, someone else will tell them how, how to do that better. And we get caught up in the same lies that we believed over here. He said that now we're on, we're on the wrong team and we're still believing the same lies. Why? Because we are not, once we are saved, we're not, we are not hostile towards God. At least we try not to be. What we need to be is to go, okay, God's on my side. God told me I need to go evangelize. I need to go disciple. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. How do I do that? Let's start. That's what this really means. Okay? Let's continue forward. Not only is, do we believe that Satan is a person, 
Usually, okay, I usually say Satan is a person. That's the way I was always taught it. Satan was a created being is really what it means there. Okay, if you ever hear me say Satan is a person, that, that what I really am saying is Satan is a created being. That's the reason why I changed what it said for us is so that we have the theologically correct. I say it, that's just the way I've always been taught to say it. I'm sorry about that. So, Satan is a created being. Hell is an eternal place. There's, there, are two, there are two races of people on the earth. Statement 5 has told us that. Those who believe, those who do not believe. There's only two races on earth. Everything else is, that's it. Okay? Statement number 6. We believe that men are justified on the single ground of faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that only by God's grace and through faith alone are we saved. Yeah, that, that was a good one. I, you should amen that one. That, that, was a good, that was a good place. Amen that one. So, Pastor Mark, it seems like there's a lot of words there. There are. I want you, uh, and I, I want you to understand where the scripture that we're going to read here is Acts 13. And that sounds, and I want you to know, I promise you, it sounds like you'll start reading it and going, Pastor Mark, how in the world did you get that statement from those verses? Well, I'm gonna, we're going to get there, okay? Acts 13, 33 through 39. Sounds odd, but follow me. Then he, then he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus. As also, it is written in the, second, in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Verse number 34. And as the fact that he raised him from the dead. Now, this is who we're talking about here. Jesus. Because he raised Jesus from the dead. No more to return to corruption. That word corruption is there important. It means sin. Because he raised him from the dead. Raising him from corruption into, into the, the new life. He has spoken this way. I will give you the, the holy and sure blessing of David. Verse number 35. Therefore, he says also in, the, in another psalm. You will not let your holy one see corruption. Verse 36. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid in his father, laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he who God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this, that through this man, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, Jesus, everyone who believes is freed from everything that, uh, from which you could not be freed from by the law of Moses. I love that. That's really one of those, like, you go, okay, Pastor Mark, you're excited. And I'm confused. Let's talk a moment. So, through Jesus... Jesus was born on this earth, okay? Jesus did not just drop down, crawl on the cross, and die for your sins, did he? No. What did he do? He fulfilled all scripture. He was born of a virgin in this little town of, of bread called Bethlehem. He's of the house and lineage of David. This is the reason why David is mentioned here. Because what did David do? David, David all, all of his glory... All he could do was what? Live and die. Jesus. Jesus was different. He not only was born, not only did he live a perfect life, he then died in your place and in my place on the cross. And now, he didn't just die. And, and, and okay, and sort of what you're not reading here is the sort of, the little bit of sarcasm that's right there. Okay, because it's in there. I want you to know your Bible is actually full of sarcasm if you'll read it. Not, but Jesus didn't just come and he lived and he died and he's, still, he's not in the grave and he's, and he's rotting. What did, what did Jesus do? He rose again. And then you get the end of it. And this is where it gets really exciting for me. It says, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, through Jesus... Through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Oh, never before have we been able to say, hey, look, where do I get my sins forgiven from? We've always had to, uh, until this point, we've always had to go and take lambs, and we've had to take doves, and we had to take sheep, and all these other things, and bulls, and we've had to murder them and have the spilled blood so that once a year we can have atonement and, and try to make it semi-right because of what God's what the law of Moses said. Jesus came and he died for us. His blood was shed for us. 
He was buried for us. So the forgiveness of sins, so that's step one of that. But then what? By, and verse number 39. And by him, Jesus, everyone who believes is freed. Freed of what? All those who believe on him are freed from the burden of sin. But you and I go, but Pastor Mark, I don't feel free. Why is that? You and I have spent so much time being against God. Now that we're free, we're kind of going, I don't know what to do. I've never been on this team. What do I do now? But this is saying, in verse number 38, you have been freed. Act like it, number one. You've been, sins have been forgiven. And from everything that was in you, can not be freed by the law of Moses. Oh, I love this. So, not only that, you don't have to do this every year. You're free from now until eternity. Oh, and then what? You're so, not only are you free for the rest of eternity, but you get to live like it. In case someone forgot to tell you, you can live like you're free from sin. Did you know that? Live like it. But Pastor Mark, you don't know what's going on in my life. I know I don't. God does. And he loves you and he frees you from sin. I know, but I kind of like my sin. It kind of it makes me warm and fuzzy inside. No. God here is saying, look, I've hit. Jesus went and he lived and he died to free you from this bondage. You and I get to have the statement of faith to say, look, this is where we stand. So whenever we have people that want to come back and say, hey, I remember you. You used to blah, 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 blah. You hear me go, yeah, I was horrible at that. I was uh, Paul's verse. I was the chief among sinners. I love that verse, by the way. If, if there was a sinner, by Jove, I was their leader. I was Mother, uh, this is a joke that you all won't get, but I was Mother Rico to them, okay? Like, it was, there was a leader, of, uh, like, like, if I was in sin, I was going to be the one who was going to lead it. So when someone comes and they say that to you, what should you do? You go, absolutely, you're absolutely right. However, let me tell you about this man named Jesus. Jesus came into my life. I believed in him. I confessed him. He forgave me of all of that. But I still remember. I know. I remember too. But Jesus forgave me. So, what do we, what do we have to do with this? I want to help you with, when we're talking about salvation, every preacher, pastor I've ever met says it just a little bit different. Okay, And I want to help you. Because when we talk about salvation, salvation is very important. It's a very key element to what we believe. So, you, you, you probably have heard of others. These are the only ones I could really think of while I was going to and fro at Deep Impact. Okay, So, you will hear people say things like, just call upon the name of Jesus. Right? You, you might have heard that. Hey, you know, you, if you'll just call upon the name of Jesus, you'll be saved. And I remember being little and going, what in the world does that mean? Okay? You've heard other people say, just ask Jesus into your heart. Okay? Uh, I, I belong to a number of people, a uh, number of groups, and you know they, they sort of poke fun at this. And they're, they're missing the whole point. Yes, I understand. Theologically, that's not right. But it is something we say. Why? Well, we're going to get there. Believe in Jesus and confess him. That's usually what you'll hear me say because I'm, I'm kind of quoting Romans, uh, Romans chapter 10 there. I'm almost verbatim quoting that. Or the last one, just pray the, the, the salvation prayer. You, and again, you've probably grown up with people and they've said it different ways and different things. And I get all that. But when we're talking about salvation, the reason I, I want to talk about this is they're trying to put a verse into action. What is it? Whenever I believe in Christ and I want to step across that divide and I really want to walk in faith. Because remember, what what does the statement say? It's by grace alone. It's through faith alone. But how how do I do that? Right? And pastors, I want you to know, we're all saying the same thing most of the time. There's, there's There's the oddity person, anyway. 
what they're trying to do is they're trying their best to get you to understand Romans, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, a John 3, 16 type of a verse, or even a Romans 10, 13 verse. Look at these really quickly. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says, what, you, what do you need to do to, to, to have Christ as a Savior? Believe in your heart, confess Him with your mouth. Okay, that's what Scripture says. How do I do that? Well, again, if I asked you to do it, you would do it differently than I would do it. That's fine. I'm just trying to help you understand that we're not going, what, what are we not going to do? We're not going to get hung up in words, these words. What are we going to get hung up on? We believe that there's a difference between those who are saved and those who are unsaved. We believe that it is called upon us to help those who are unsaved do what? Get to, the, get to a knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ so they believe and confess Him. That's what a statement of faith actually says. Don't get hung up here. Okay? John 3, 16. The word that you're looking for there is the whosoever. I love that word. Okay? And I want you to know, um, they actually do make a book. You can find it on Amazon for those people who don't believe that it is a for whosoever. But there's a book on Amazon, and the whole book just really just said whosoever. And it's written over and over and over and over again. It's like a hundred some pages of just the word whosoever. Why? Who can believe in Jesus? Whosoever. And then you get to Romans 10, 13. And I love this one too. Because you really does talk about calling upon the name of the Lord. So, that's what we're not going to get hung up on. What are we going to get concerned about? Where do we stand? We believe that there are two races and that people are in desperate need of Jesus Christ. Well, last but not least, I was not going to include this one, but I decided to anyway, and I'm glad I did. Because I had just enough time to go through it. Number 12. It says this. It says, we believe in the resurrection of both the saved and the lost. Okay? So whenever you hear people, you ever hear really good Christians say, I just can't wait for resurrection day. Well, amen, because I know what you're saying, but we believe there's a resurrection of everyone. Both the saved and the lost. The saved will be into the resurrection of life and the lost into the resurrection of damnation. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this. I think it's really. I think there's some irony there because John writes this, and all we have done for the last two thousand years is marvel at this. <laughs> We've done the exact opposite of what John wanted us to do. Actually, what Jesus wanted us to do. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. Those who are saved done uh, have who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I love that. Because you hear Paul talk about it later, right? Paul, later on, will write, what, what, in, later in Scripture, he probably wrote it first, though, by the way. I want you to know that. If you time out your Bible the way that it was written, John probably didn't write his gospel until after Paul had already been writing. But what did Paul say? Do not fear those who are asleep, my brothers. For when the trumpet of God shall sound, those who are dead shall be called up. And we, those of which are alive and remain shall be what? Also called up in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And we have done nothing but marvel at this since the word was written down. Why? Why is this so important? Because there's a couple of things. Every person will live eternally. Whether you like them or not, whether you think they're the best person in the world, whether you think they are the worst person that was ever created. And I want you to know, if we were to stop and, I know, if I said, hey, could you give me a list of those who you think are the worst people that have ever been created? You probably could give me a list and start off with some, some pretty big names on there. Right? But can I tell you something from the Bible? They needed to hear the gospel. But, but pastor, they were, they were horrible people. I know. By our own judgment, they were horrible people. But can I tell you something? So were you and I. Before we accepted Christ as Savior, there was no difference between that most horrible of person and you and me. Oh, but pastor, I like to think I was a little bit better. Nope. We were just as much of enemies of God 
before salvation. Everyone will live eternally. But like the good, you know, like every good realtor, the the most important thing is location. Location, location, location. Some will go into eternal life. Now, if you ever hear someone say they will have eternal life, what we're typically talking about are those who believe in Christ and they will they will be in eternity heaven with God. We usually call that eternal life. Okay? Now, we use that word incorrectly because everyone is going to live eternally somewhere. Okay? What we're saying is those who have accepted Christ will be living in eternity in life, in heaven, in the blessings of God. Okay? Um, and I want you to know, if you think that we're all going to be floating around on a cloud and playing a harp, I've got, I've got bad news for you. God's Word never says that either. What are we going to be doing? Go read the book of Revelation. Find out. It's phenomenal. The new heaven and the new, new Jerusalem. Oh, that's phenomenal. Go read it. Go study it for yourself. But if there's a life, if there's a heaven, if there's a blessing of God, what else is there? There is a death. There is a hell. There is a judgment of God. But what do we do, Pastor? Well, God's called us to evangelize. God's called us to stand. And I want you to know that in the world that we are living in, what's incredible to me is the lack of people that are willing to stand. Being part of Lighthouse Baptist Church, a statement of faith, this is where we're standing. Now, you might be scared, and you might go, Pastor Mark, I just, I just don't know. Okay. This is where we're going to stand. Well, Pastor, what happens if someone disagrees with us? Okay. That doesn't hurt my feelings. Why? I'm going to try to tell them truth. Now, if truth hurts your feelings, I'm, I'm sorry. I usually will say something, I'm sorry you feel that way. Why? Because it's true. But Pastor... It means there's an eternal place of, of, there's, yeah, there is. There's heaven and there's hell. It's how we usually talk, talk about it. The other one that's included in here, and it's kind of, if I, we talk about it just a little bit. It's very much a Baptist uh, belief from God's word. And we sort of, we say it sort of this way. We believe in the eternal security of the believer. Why, how do you get that? Well, look back at what it says. Those who have been saved will be called into the resurrection of life. Well, what happens if you lose it? You can't lose it. The verses I love here are actually, if you go and you read Jesus, Jesus says, all those who, who the Father has given to me are in my hand. I love that. But then what does he go and say? But then it's also in my Father's hand, so it's like encapsulated on top of it. You're never going to lose you. Not one. Well, he lives. So, what do I do with that? Well, pastor, I have friends who believe in they can lose their salvation. Pray for them. Read the Bible with them. Ask them, where do you find that in God's word? Okay? Don't get into this argument thing. Where do you find it in God's word? Read. Because read along with them. And then go, God, Jesus also says this. How do you do? How, what do they do with it? What am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to be theologians. Pastor Mark, I'm not a theologian. You believe in God, you're a theologian. Welcome. You've been, you've been inducted. It's not just a bunch of guys who walk around, you know, drafty libraries reading really big books. We can, and we kind of like to. But God's given you a book, and he wants you to read it. He wants you to study it. And he wants you to study it so well that the more that you study it, and I've said this before, and you go and going, I think the more I study it, the less I know. Probably true. 
which means I've got to study it more. So, when we take all of these, we have to sort of figure out what do we do with this. And this is what I want you to walk, walk away with this, walk home with this. Here's the questions to consider this. How does my view of Satan change with or change because of Scripture? I don't know what you've been thinking about, and I want you to know. Yeah, you're right. This book has, has played a lot about the way that we view things. Okay. What, view, what, what influence has this book had in your view of Satan? Well, I don't really ever know, Pastor Mark. I've never really stopped to think about studying that. You should. It's in there. It's phenomenal. <laughs> it's really neat. And then, because uh, I know what you're going to do, you're going to keep. You're going to come to me and go, "Okay, how does this timeline work out?" And I'm going to look at you and go, "I don't know." And it's phenomenal. Why? Because it's in God's Word. So how does that change? Number two. Does my view of eternity? change our evangelism i think the reason that most of us do not evangelize is because we cannot grasp eternity one of my one of my favorite analogies and at some point in time i will use it and i will steal it directly from francis chan and he uses the the great example of this really long piece of rope and he goes this is your life and everybody's like oh that's great and he gets to the handle of it and the handle's coated in red he goes, this is your life on earth. And everybody goes, oh. And the rest of the rope, he goes, that's your, where you're going to spend eternity. You are nothing but a vapor here. Eternity is forever. What do you, how, and if I view eternity like it's forever, how does that change my interactions with other vapors as we're walking along? I hope for some of you it just goes, you know what, that means I need to start evangelizing. Okay. Last one is probably the most important. Do you know where you will spend eternity? Do you know Christ is your Savior? If you, if you can't answer that, there is no more important question. There's, there's, there's literally n- nothing, nothing else matters. Do you know Christ is your Savior? Well, Pastor Mark, I've, I, I think I've said it, or maybe I did, or maybe I didn't, and I really don't know. Well, then do it today. Make the statement today. Well, pa- Pastor Mark, there's, there, there's people here. Yeah, I know. There's people here that will love on you. What, what happens if we won't make fun of you? We want to love on you. This is what I'm going to ask you to please do. I'm going to ask you to please stand. We've went over just a few minutes. I'm, I will apologize to my nursery workers later. Or never. By now they should be expecting it. This is what I want you to do. Do this with me. I want you to bow your head. I want you to close your eyes. And we're going to work through these sort of backwards. And because the very first and foremost of this is, do you know where you'll spend eternity? What are you doing with Jesus Christ? If you do not have an answer for that today, well, let me encourage you to make the day the day of salvation. Make that proclamation today and, and just do it with me. And I want you to know, I'm not going to make you come forward. I'm not going to do any of those types of things. What I really am going to ask you to do is though, if, if you make this, this miss, say, hey, I'm gonna, I want to believe in Christ. I want to confess him as my Savior. I want you to come and I want you to find me and I want you to tell me. Because I'm going to be excited for you. And I want you to tell other people. They're going to be excited for you. So with, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you today, maybe your prayer this day is, is simply, God, I'm a sinner. I believe in your Son. I want to confess Him as Lord of my life. Please forgive me of my sins. Help me to walk in newness of life. And in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, again, I want you to just, to, in, a, in a few moments, whenever we're dismissed, I want you to come and just shake hands or come and just let me know that. Because we are so, we'll be so, so excited for you. For others, let's now talk about other things. Now, now, that, now, now that I got everybody on the same team, how does your view of eternity change the way that you evangelize? Well, Pastor Mark, I've never really thought about, evan- about, about eternity and never really think about evangelism. Well, they're both, they're both very very real 
Eternity is just around the corner. How does your evangelism change? And then the very first one, how does my view of Satan change with Scripture? Uh, for some of us, it might just be, Lord, help me, help me pray, help me get through this, help me, help me change and have a more biblical, accurate view of those things that are around me and those things that are affecting me. Let's pray together, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for being able to come and together, together. And Lord, we do pray that as we study and as we stand on these things, Lord, that we would stand in such places and stand in such a way that it would change us, Lord, and that it would change more towards you because everything, all these things are from your, from your word. And God, we pray that as we change and become more like you, Lord, that we would also be willing to look in a lost and dying world that is dying and going to hell and then going into an eternal separation uh, from your goodness, Lord, and to going into the place of judgment, that, Lord, as, as we see those people, Lord, that we would be, be willing to do as your word has said and, and tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. Help us with that, Lord. Help us change the way that we see things. Help us change and maybe be aware. And, maybe, and for some of us, Lord, that we're aware, now give us boldness. Help us step. Help us take that next step and, and to, to share and to open our mouth. And I know, Lord, there's some in here, just, they're, just, they're just absolutely scared to death to be, to, be, to be that person to share. Give them strength. Give them courage. Give them wisdom. Because, Lord, you continually just ask us to step out. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you for this day. We thank you for each one that's here. We thank you for those who... Uh, could not be here because of other things outside of them and uh, outside of conditions. And Lord, we pray you bless them today. Lord, we thank you for all of this. For it's in your Son's name we do pray. Amen. At this point in time, I want to just point your point your attention to a couple of things. Remember, the Vacation Bible School assignment is going to be next week. We will be having Wednesday night this this Wednesday, unless the power goes out again. Um, be in prayer for those who are without power. And then, uh, Mr. Chad, I'm going to ask you to give us a quick word of prayer.